Hello, and welcome back to the Prophecy Pros Podcast. This season, we've been really talking about the emotions of prophecy, the felt needs, what people are, are feeling as they look at the conditions of the world and as they try to figure out scripture and wrestle with the realities of Bible prophecy and eschatology and what scripture says, you know, taking a look at some of the hard sayings of, of the Bible, things that uh, typically people want to gloss over, but God wants us to, to learn these things. Otherwise, he wouldn't have put them in scripture. Uh, but today we're talking about a biggie, and it's a, it's probably one of the heavier emotions that we're going to tackle this season. And it's this, it's just sadness. Uh, and there's various reasons for that sadness that we're going to kind of unpack here shortly, but it's a, it's a real emotion. It's real. Uh, we can't gloss over it and say, oh, you shouldn't be sad when you think about different things because it's a reality uh, that's in us. It's an emotion that's very heavy and very real, especially if we have people that we love and want to accept the Lord, but have not accepted the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's usually where the sadness lands. It's a family member, uh, someone that's very close to someone. And, you know, like at conferences, we'll have people like, like a few weeks ago is, is at a conference and a lady brought her unsaved husband mm -hmm. uh, because he, she, she said, he thinks I'm crazy, you know, because I believe in, in the Bible prophecy. Mm -hmm. But she said, I wanted him to hear it from, you know, uh, a, a sound, reasoned, reasonable teacher to hear you know, why these things are true. But it said, it makes my heart sad because you know, he didn't believe it. Or people that we know who have uh, wayward children, or you know, as, as we continue to ramp up towards Revelation, Todd, then people are looking at their family going, you know, I'm ready, but they're not ready. And what happens to them you know, if, they, if they are left behind? And that obviously produces a lot of sadness um, in someone's life. Think about parents, uh, maybe grandparents, people maybe that are closer to death, at least chronologically, and you go, what happens if they die? So, you know, you think about people that you love, and uh, and so what we want to do is we want to sort of take a look biblically at, at humanity as a whole and to see, you know, a little bit why that sadness comes up, but also see the other side as well. In other words, we want to see uh, the fact that we, we may be feeling sad, but there's some active choices that are being made on the part of people that continually reject the Lord. Mm -hmm. And and one passage I think about is uh, in Romans 3, uh, where, you know, we, we, we talk about something, why can't they see it? Why, why can't they understand it? You know, and then I'm reminded of what Paul said uh, in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says uh, that uh, the God of this world blinds the eyes of people to the gospel. So Satan is a great blinder. He's a great distractor. You know, and we know he's a deceiver, but he's also a distractor. You know, he'll distract your attention to something else so you can't or won't, you know, look at the gospel. Uh, but he also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 14, he says, the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit, Spirit of God. Uh, they're foolishness to him. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to say, because the things of the Spirit of God are things that require spiritual discernment, which natural people don't have, people without Christ and the Holy Spirit. So theologically, it's important for us to acknowledge the fact that if you have an unsaved relative, uh, you know, mom or dad, son or daughter, whatever, someone that you love, best friend, and they don't know Christ, understand that there are spiritual forces at work here. Uh, this is not just, you know, they're just dumb or they can't comprehend. It's not that at all. It's not about intelligence. Uh, it, it's about spiritual warfare. So Satan blinds people. We know from the parable uh, taught in, in Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower and the soils, that Satan comes down like a bird and snatches that seed away before he can uh, take root. So I think a beginning point would be to just to, to acknowledge the fact that natural people, they're blind. Uh, Ephesians 2 says they're dead. And what can a dead person do? Mm -hmm. uh, and over here in, in Romans chapter 3, it says that uh, there is none righteous. No, not one. Uh, there is none who, uh, who understands God. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become uh, useless. There's none who does good, not even one. I mean, Paul's like, I'm going to repeat this thing to till we get it. And he's talking about obviously unsaved people, Todd. But then he concludes, and, and this is where maybe some people that you know are, it says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. So when we start talking about things like, you know, it comes up in a conversation, we talk about the tribulation, the war of Gog and Magog, the second coming of Christ, the Antichrist, Mark of the Beast. Um, but there's no fear there. 
they, they just simply dismiss it, much like I'm sure Noah's generation did when he started talking about the flood. Mm -hmm. So all that to say is understand that the, there are spiritual forces and spiritual issues at play here when you start talking about this issue. There really are. And, you know, that's a good good place to start is kind of dial it back, go to the, the foundational cause of all that, and it's total depravity, mm -hmm. uh, a term that you don't hear used that, that often. But it, mean, it doesn't mean mankind is always as bad as they could be. It means by nature, we are born in sin. We are born dead, spiritually dead. We are incapable of understanding the things of God. And I can relate to to that. You know, I, I have uh, friends and loved ones who I've just thought, man, if I could just present it clearly enough, surely just the logic of it alone, they'll be like, oh, let me embrace Christ right now. But there's something deeper at play. There's something, they're, they're spiritually dead. John, you know, John 3, the famous chapter, you know, John 3, 16, everyone knows, for God so loved the world. But if you back up a few, a few verses, uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Uh, he has to be born, of, and he says later, born of the water and born of spirit. In other words, a natural birth, but you need a spiritual birth. You need a new spirit to be able to see the things of God. Um, so it, it, there's an there's a, there's a underlying fundamental cause of all that that we don't see. So it's not like we can reason someone into it. Uh, it's a supernatural work of God. We're called to present the gospel and kind of leave the results up to him. But just to, to own that fact, it is painful when people we love and want to be in heaven uh, continually reject the Lord, even when we give our best effort in terms of what we say or maybe just how we live. Even we've tried to just love them into the kingdom, so to speak, and uh, just be kind to them and that kind of thing. So all that just to, to own the fact that we understand that sadness is very real, that we want people uh, to come to Christ and we want people to be in heaven with us. We want to take as many people with us uh, as possible. Absolutely. And, you know, Jesus said in, um, in John chapter six, uh, verse 44, he says, no man can come to me unless the father draws him. Mm -hmm. and I love in, in J.I. Packer's great uh, classic book, Evangelism of the Sovereignty of God. He says, everybody believes in God's sovereignty uh, when they start talking about evangelism, because you don't pray to men that they accept Christ. You pray to God that men would accept Christ. And so we always have to begin uh, with God there. So I think that's really important that we, that we acknowledge that. The other thing is that knowing that people don't just magically come to Christ on their own, then what we're doing is how we're acknowledging the fact that God has to do something. Mm -hmm. God has to be the first uh, responder, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, in this situation. He has, to, he has to be the first one to express love. And, th and then the person then has a choice they can make. You know, but God has to be the one because as we saw in this Romans 3 passage, no person, they're not out there seeking God. Now they're seeking the things that God can provide that only God can provide, like love and peace and security and significance and all those things. But they're not actively seeking the person of God because if they did, they'd be dying to themselves because they'd be bowing before the, their creator. Uh, but, but they want the things that God can give, but they just don't want God to be the one in charge of their life. So again, you know, people that sometimes are rejecting Christ or not doing it because they can't, uh, they can't figure out things or there are these obstacles that are preventing them. Many times it's just simply because God will start messing with my life. If I give my life to Jesus, then, you know, he's going to wreck me. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was my biggest fear mm -hmm. as a, as an unsaved 16 year old kid. You know, I, I just thought, well, if, if, if Jesus comes in my life, he's going to take away the 10 things I love the most and make me do the 10 things I hate the most. And so he's just, and he's going to make me marry an ugly woman and send me to some continent to be a missionary. And, and I don't want to do any of those things. And so uh, I found out none of those things were actually true. Okay. Uh, but that's Satan's, uh, you know, deceptive, you know, nature to keep us from, from the gospel. So all that to say is when we, when we look at people, they're not going to come to Christ on their own. They need a witness. And so that's why you have that sadness is because you go, how do I do that? You know, how do I reach uh, my unsaved relative? Well, before we get to that point, Todd, I think it's, it'd be helpful just to see that when we talk about humanity, that humanity is not going to uh, magically get better as we get closer to the end times. As they see Israel, they see globalism creeping on, they see technology for the mark of the beast, see so all these things happening. On their own, they're not going to just say, wake up and have a light bulb moment. Um, but Todd, as we trace through Revelation, and we get to the first set of judgments, the sealed judgments, 
uh, and we get there, that familiar passage uh, in uh, chapter 6, uh, verse, verses 15 and following, talk, what do we see people doing initially uh, when God's judgments uh, start hitting the earth? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty telling. Uh, verse 15, then the kings of the earth, the princes and the generals, the rich and the mighty, and every slave and every free man. So in other words, every person you could think of from yeah, top Bible to bottom. Talk for everybody, yeah. right? Uh, hidden caves among the rocks in the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of the wrath has come and who can stand. So there's this trajectory mm -hmm. of man's heart rebelling against God. And even in the face, even when they know it's God's wrath yeah. that is falling on them and they see the grace of God, by the way, all around them, because at the same time, mm -hmm. There'll be millions, of, the biggest revival in the history of the world will be taking place. But the the ungodly will still reject that, will still push it away. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty powerful. It is. So so we see that, that you know, in the tribulation period, there's fear. But you the, the fear doesn't lead to repentance. The fear just leads to self, um, uh, self-protection, you know, and, and just trying to, uh, to surround themselves with something that's going to keep them from going to God. Uh, from getting to this God. So that's, again, that's the natural nature of humanity. We don't want God. Uh, I love R.C. Sproul used to give a talk to young people of all things. He talked to teenagers and he would say, here's your basic problem. It says, you guys hate God. That, that's your problem. And they go, wait a minute. We that's don't shooting hate, straight we right don't there. We don't hate God. And it's like, no, you do. You really do. You hate God because you won't let him be in charge of your life. You won't submit yourself to him. You won't follow him. You won't give up everything for him. You won't be his disciple. You love him more than father, mother, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, then you finally realize, well, I guess I do kind of hate God you know, it's like because of the way I'm living. So the idea is that these people hate God. Now, it would be interesting if the next verse said, but then they came to their senses and they crawled out from those rocks and came out from the caves and the mountains and they got on their knees and came to Christ. But guess what? These particular people, which is the vast majority of humanity, they don't do it. How do we know that? Keep going, Revelation, Revelation chapter nine, and we're now at the sixth trumpet judgment, and this is after this um, demonic cavalry uh, of two hundred million demons come out and start tormenting uh, those on the earth, and it says in verse uh, verse twenty, it says, and the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, the the smoke and the fire and the brimstone out of their mouths, says, did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and brass and stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk, nor did they repent of their murders, of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. Mm -hmm. So that gives you an idea of what life's going to be like for those who are left behind. It's going to be a world filled with violence and murder, with immorality. It's Mardi Gras on steroids. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's going to be sorceries uh, with, with uh, all, and some have translated this as the Greek word pharmakian, which uh, can be translated pharmacy. Uh, so some people think it's going to be an explosion of the opio, opioid epidemic uh, during that time. It's certainly possible. Uh, but also demon worship and, and theft. So, so looting and all that stuff that goes on uh, during uh, chaos. So they're worshiping demons, maybe even the very demons that are tormenting them. Who knows? But what does this tell us? Humanity goes from hiding from God to now there's they're they're now they ran to their sin and they're embracing sin and they're just like overdosing on all types of different sinful behavior. So that's that's the where humanity is going, you know, if these people don't get saved. So so Todd, it's a it's a time where uh during the tribulation, you know, while Antichrist is saying peace and safety, the world is just devolving, you know, into an, an absolute, you know, abyss of of immorality and sinful behavior. They sure are. And, you know, Jesus told us that as well in all of that discourse. It had to be just like the days of Noah mm. and like the days of Lot. Yeah. And we're seeing the ramp up to that now, but we, we're not seeing the full import of that until uh, the tribulation itself. You know, it said it, it in uh, Genesis 6, it said, every thought and intent of man's heart was only evil mm. continually. Noah built the ark for 120 years, yet nobody except for he, his three sons and their wives uh, accepted the Lord at that time. It's going to be the same, even though all the supernatural stuff is right. You, you would think a 200 million demonic 
Calvary would get your attention and make you finally turn to the Lord. Uh, but instead they continue to worship demons and, and all the other stuff you mentioned. Uh, it reminds me of, you know, when Jesus talked about the rich man and, and Lazarus, uh, which was not a parable. It was actually a story, a true, true account. Uh, he tells us what's going on in the heart and mind of the rich man, rich, rich man, as he's in, uh, the current hell or, you know, the kind of the waiting, the, the place of torment. Yeah. And he sees Lazarus and he's like, if you could just dip, dip your finger in some water and just mm -hmm. quench my thirst a little bit from this torment. But then he says something along the lines, lines of, will you please go have Lazarus go to my brothers and tell them that this is real. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, but Jesus said, they have Moses and the prophets. Mm -hmm. If they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe even if someone rises from the dead and tells them, which is what happened. Mm -hmm. Jesus rose from the dead and still people don't believe. Yeah. Um, so all of that to say part of the reason that, and we'll get, we'll get to kind of the, the, the response to the sadness, part of the reason that we are sad is because we don't fully appreciate the, the sinful nature of humanity and the holiness of God. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason, and I'm, we're tipping our hand a little bit to the kind of the, the counter to all this is that when we see God for how holy he really is, and then we see in the light of that, how sinful we really are. Uh, I think we're just going to rejoice in the fact that God does what's perfect and that he punishes evil. Uh, and, and it's, we're going to understand more fully then than we do now. Uh, but that's kind of the crux of it all. Yeah. So, so mankind goes from, uh, from hiding from God to not repenting of their sin. And where does it lead? It leads to the, to the midpoint of the tribulation where they actually take the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. You say, wait a minute. It, Maybe some of those people are going to feel bad for taking the mark, and no, they're not. In fact, in chapter 14, uh, verse 9, it says, Another angel, a third one, followed them, saying, With a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and received a mark, a series of mark on his forehead or upon his hand, that same person will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of, of the holy angels. Uh, and the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of the torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. All those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark uh, of his name. So what Scripture's saying there is that there's going to come this sort of, as we say in the South, a fish or cut bait moment where it's like you got to choose one or the other. And these people who weren't repenting of their sins chose Antichrist over God, over the God who's sending these judgments. And so they, they eternally, they essentially seal their destiny at that moment. So not a single person who takes the mark of the beast will then later repent of taking the mark. Every one of them will end up in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. And then Todd, it just goes on. It just gets worse and worse. And those people, it says, as the judgments continue, uh, then uh, in, in the third bowl judgment where God smites the rivers, uh, God says, um, look, they poured out the blood of saints and prophets. He says, you've given them blood to drink. He says, they deserve it. So now God's saying, all right, I'm pouring it on now. And it says that he, uh, uh, the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun. It was given to, to scorch men with fire and men were scorched with heat. And what they do, they blasphemed the name of God and did not repent. Uh, and then the, the, it goes on to say in the very next verse that the kingdom of Antichrist was darkened and it was so dark over, over Antichrist's kingdom that it says they gnawed their tongues. That was that's how frustrated they were. And it says, and they blasphemed the God of heaven, and they did not repent. Mm -hmm. And then you go all the way over uh, to uh, to chapter uh, 16. Uh, and um, excuse me, that was chapter 16. But you go all the yeah, go all the way over to 19. And, uh, and what's happening there, you know, they, they come back, and now they're at Armageddon. They want to kill God. Mm -hmm. so, so humanity is clearly not going to get any better. So why do we say that? You say, wait a minute, you we're talking about sadness. You're making me more sad here. <laughs> it's like, no, that's not the point. But the point is to theologically understand and prophetically understand where humanity is going. Now, this should light a fire under all of us as we think about those that we love that are currently not saved, and we think about them having to go through the tribulation. Perhaps some of the people that we know will be left behind, and they'll be a part of that great revival. Maybe they're going to realize through your witness now they'll be able to recall that during that time. And that might be what actually brings them to the Lord. So it's, so that's why we say, even if someone is left behind, it doesn't mean it's the end of the story. It could, but it doesn't mean that necessarily. 
So Todd, let's let's now pivot then, and let's talk about some positive ways uh, to begin to uh, to reach them, or at least try to reach them for Christ right now. Yeah, I think you know we do what we can. Again, we 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 preach the gospel, but if somebody, we've probably all had this. Uh, event where there's someone who we have an ongoing relationship with where we've tried to tell them about the gospel and they literally say, I don't want to hear it anymore. Or you can tell by their demeanor, they've heard enough. Then you live your life. You live the gospel. You serve them. You show them what Christ is like by your behavior. Mm -hmm. um, write books. You know, we write books that we want to leave behind. If mm -hmm. the rapture were to happen in our lifetime, uh, I, pray it, I pray it does, but we move forward and live our lives as if it may not. We have to plan for both both avenues, but uh, we we want to leave things behind. Whether it's conversations we had with people, books left behind, uh, things like that. I think a lot of people who are witnessing, if the rapture were to happen in our lifetime, I think many of the people who we try to witness to now that don't want anything to do with it will finally wake up and realize, oh, they actually knew what they were talking about. And all we can do is pray that we want people to be saved from having to go through the tribulation period. Uh, but the good thing is, as, as Gref, uh, Jeff has alluded to here, is that there's still grace available in the tribulation period. So they, many people will be saved during that time. Uh, and one, one note about the, the uh, mark of the beast, because I get this question a lot and we get this question a lot at conferences is, will anyone take the mark by accident? And as Jeff highlighted, I just want to kind of reiterate, no, when people take the mark, it's not just to become part of the financial system. Mm -hmm. They are choosing to worship the beast. They are choosing to align with with the devil and with the antichrist, and 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 that's why at the end they're literally trying to fight God. So uh, it's something they know that they're doing. So no one, don't worry that someone's going to accidentally take the mark of the beast. Um, but we want to we want our family and friends to be safe from even having to be faced with any of that. So we got to do what we can now to pray them into the kingdom, preach them into the kingdom and be the hands and feet of Jesus to them in every chance that we get. Amen. And and just note this, too, that, you know, I became a Christian at age 16, grew up in a non-Christian home, as, as Todd did. Um, you know, I, the first thing, I, the only people I wanted to know, know to know Christ was my family. Mm -hmm. So I immediately went home. I mean, that night went home, started preaching to my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were like, what? what? What have you done with our son? And so, but for me, honestly, um, it was frustrating because everything I said just fell flat. Mm -hmm. uh, I, every book I gave them, every gospel track, every I drag them to church or whatever, it, nothing worked. And and like you said, Todd, finally God just says, "Look, live your life, and be the kind of example that they can at least look to." Should God prompt something inside them? And I think about too about First uh, Peter three, uh, fifteen. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. That's our job mm -hmm. to do. Make sure Christ is Lord in your heart. And he says, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. You know, and part of the frustration, to be quite honest with you, and maybe you felt this if you've got someone that you know and you love very much and it makes you sad and they're not saved. Sometimes you actually kind of get angry at them. You know, you just kind of say, look, I'm, I'm kind of fed up with the fact that you won't come to Jesus. What's wrong with you, you know? And, and so we have to channel that anger and turn that anger into compassion and make sure that, that we're seeing them as God is seeing them because Jesus loves them mm -hmm. and Jesus died for them and rose again. So we should have a heart of compassion, but we also should, should be ready to answer their hard questions. Mm -hmm. now, not to say that just because you gave them the right answer, they're going to say, oh, well, I guess I'll come to Christ now. Doesn't always happen like that. But it does say give a defense. You know, given an apology, which means to, to make an, adult, an argument in a courtroom, give a, a, a rational defense of your faith. Answer the question. If you don't know the answer, go find it. That's why we write the books that we write, so that you can have answers to some of these hard questions. So make sure Christ is Lord in your heart. Study enough so that you can know enough to give them an answer or give them a book or send them a video or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then also, I would just say this, Todd, is that it's important for us to, to obviously we're rightly motivated. We said that, but there are, there's also a sense of urgency too. Mm -hmm. And now the urgency can be taken two ways, Todd. It can be taken like, oh, it's all up to me to make it happen right now. It's not that kind of urgency. Uh, but at the same time, it's up to me to at least be faithful. Mm -hmm. So don't put off sharing Christ with them. Don't put off these things. Have those honest conversations and, and leave it open-ended, you know, and your relationship with them 
is going to be your greatest tool. Mm -hmm. So coming out of left field with someone, they're probably not going to respond. But keep that relationship, you know, strong. Keep the connection going. And out of that relationship, you'll at least have a, a platform uh, into, uh, into their lives to speak. And I'll just say one more thing, Todd, uh, before I toss it back to you, is that do not underestimate the power of prayer. Mm -hmm. Is that God wants you to pray for them. There are spiritual forces at work uh, in, in the unseen realm, and we do battle when we get on our knees. And so pray and, and don't stop praying for them. It, it may take years. And I'll just tell you, those, those parents I was telling you about a few minutes ago, I prayed for them for 39 years mm -hmm. until they both came to Christ before they died. So, you know, don't underestimate the power of prayer. Uh, I know a lot of people, a lot of people who were saved because they had a praying grandmother or a praying mother or a praying father. So, Todd, prayer is one of the big keys in this thing. It really is. I was going to say, if, if there's been ever been a failure on my part when it comes to evangelism, it's my failure to prayer, to, to be in prayer about it. But every time I've prayed, Lord, put me in the path of somebody who needs to hear about you today. I can say almost every single time that day or soon after the Lord has put somebody either on my heart or in my path and opened up an opportunity. So I think that that's one practical takeaway is if you're like me and you have those moments where you're like, you know, my, my friend Jeff's already saved. I can't witness to him. You know, if you're surrounded by a lot of believers and you do a lot of stuff with church, Lord, pr pray, Lord, show me who, you, who to reach. Put people in my path today and help me to have the spiritual sensitivity to know when that door is open for me to say something or, or connect with them. So having that purposeful sense of urgency, covering it with prayer, being more consistent with our prayers, Lord, use me today to preach the gospel and, and looking for those God-given opportunities. I think the more we do that, uh, the more intentional we are about it, you'd be surprised how often the Lord can use you. And one side note of that is don't feel like every opportunity you have to get someone to accept the Lord right there. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, as Jeff said, it's in the context of relationship. It's in the context of you're just being used by the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's just you just say one thing that cracks that door open a little bit or, or disarms them or, or makes them think better about who Christians are. Uh, who knows how the Lord's going to do it? Some people plant, some people water, some people get to see it over the finish line. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to um, just be prayerful about that and make sure that we're 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 using we're we're changing that sadness to pur purposeful urgency, dousing it in prayer, and letting the Lord use us and letting Him be God, letting Him be sovereign. Mm. Amen. And Todd, that's about all the time we have for this episode. But listen, we want you to have joy in, in your relationship with Christ. Let that joy overflow. And let the joy also be uh, a fragrance, an aroma of life uh, to those people that might come to know Jesus. Mm. Hey, listen, we want to thank Harvest House Publishers once again for sponsoring our podcast. Uh, go over to, hop on over to harvestprophecyhq.com and you'll check out some great resources. God bless. We'll see you next time. See you.